can show it. I've got it pulled up. Right. Very good. <clears throat> All right. So welcome, everybody. We're glad you're with us. This is our fourth meeting of Publishing Addiction Science. I'm Carly Searcy with ICU DVR. And as usual, we have Dr. Pates here with us to guide us through some material. And then we're also going to look at a publication uh, that Dr. Betts shared with our group. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about um, qualitative research, which is um, a somewhat or has previously been a somewhat neglected area in addiction science, but I'm very keen on it because we find out a lot about what actually people think and what people's experiences are, lived experiences. Oh, so right, where are we? Here we are. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. So if we're ready, we'll we will start. Um, let's say qualitative research was once frowned upon. It wasn't seen as being um, scientifically rigorous and not proper science, and it was quite difficult to get published. And even when I first started um, doing research back in the, gosh, back in the late eighties, um, it was much harder to get work published um, if it was qualitative. Many journals were not publish qualitative research. And some still do not have the reviewers to review it, to referee it. And that's one of the problems. If you send in qualitative research, you want to know that the journal is able to review it properly. It's now much more acceptable and provides a very valuable insight into our subject. And I'm I'm very great fan of it. Thank you. Next slide. Once it became acceptable, it was a question of whether you used qualitative or quantitative methods. Um, then it was not acceptable to use both. You either did qualitative or quantitative. Now, again, it's much more common to use both and use what we call mixed methods. And this is especially true in dissertations. And I'll mention, I did a, a doctoral dissertation in the late nineties um, on uh, subject of needle fixation. Uh, the the compulsive injecting people using uh, uh, syringes compulsively, and it was really useful doing the qualitative part as well as the quantitative part. And I can tell you a bit more about that later. You can use quantitative methods to examine the prevalence of a problem, and qualitative methods to look at the lived experience of it. And I think one of the the things about research in the past is so much that we have asked people. We've questionnaires and we've researched things, but we haven't thoroughly asked them about their lived experience of it. And I think that's why it is so important if we're going to help people with their, their current problems. Next slide. In quantitative research, the observations was, will usually follow a systematic scheme whereby the classification of the data is already determined when the data collection starts. So what that means is that that you will design the research to say, right, this is what we're looking at. This is the research question. This is how we will gather the data and this is how we will analyze it. That's all determined before you, you start the research. It makes it possible to gather large data sets for numerical analyses. But the understanding of the data will be restricted by the concepts on which the collection of data was based. So once you've set the, the what the research question is, that's really what you will be looking at and you can't really change that. Um, next slide. In qualitative research, the observations, behavior, etc., are usually fewer and the researchers preconceptions of the data or phenomena do not determine the research results to the same extent as in quantitative research. So if this is um, a situation where you don't have so many preconceptions about what you're going to find. It's often used to study social processes or the reason behind human behavior. It's uh, the, the why and how of the social behavior matters more than what, where and when of quantitative research. Next slide. Qualitative research, uh, qualitative addiction research focuses on topics that range from historical processes to treatment outcomes and drug use phenomena, and increasingly to answer questions about alcohol and drug policy, rapid assessments of policy developments and program implementation. 
um, ethnographers have used qualitative methods to understand the patterns of substance use in various population groups. And it's interesting because I was doing a webinar with some people in Greece um, on Sunday, and one of the things they were talking about, one of them was talking about, was looking at how people thought that the policy of drug users, the policy of treating drug users impacted. And, and she was thinking of using qualitative research to to speak to both the, 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 the users, the clients, and the, the, um, the official staff that had to implement it, um, rather than just, you know, and, and therefore get a better idea of what the policy, how well the policy worked and was thought of. <clears throat> Next slide. The processes of uh, classification, deduction, and interpretation fun fundamentally uh, similar for both qualitative and quantitative methods. Quantitative methods, analyzing methods are more clear cut than qualitative methods, and various steps can be more clearly distinguished than in a qualitative study. So, in a quantitative study, you will you will use um, uh, you gather your data and use usually a statistical analysis to work out what the um, the, the answer to the research question. In qualitative work, it's much it's different because the collection and processing of the data are much more closely intertwined, especially when the researchers personally collect the data. They will not be able to avoid problems of interpretation during the collection phase. So when you um, are doing a qualitative piece of research, say you are interviewing people or you've got focus groups, you'll find that as the data comes out of that, you will start understanding it and interpreting it as you as you go along. Next slide, please. Another issue is that qualitative analysis is not restricted to an unambiguously demarcated data set in the same way a quantitative study is. So that means it's not um, it's not a rigid framework. You're not quite sure what you're going to find in a quantitative study. It can be a good idea for the researcher to keep a detailed field diary makes notes of discussion so they may refer back to these when analyzing the data. They may also record a detail they had not taken note of earlier and in the analysis this must be described in an honest and convincing way. Um, so you, you don't um, change what you're doing but you may find all sorts of interesting things that come out and, and because of that I see note taking and keeping a record of what you're doing is, is always important in, <coughs> in qualitative research. Next slide, please. Uh, significance of the data set and its social or cultural place. And this is the evaluation criteria. Researchers should be prepared to argue that their data, data are worth analyzing. It's not easy to identify criteria for the significance of the data. However, the researcher should carefully define the social and cultural place and production conditions of the data. So it, it, so the data that you're collecting from your interviews with your focus group it has got to be uh, embedded in the, what the social and cultural place, you know, who, the, who are the people, where are you doing the work? Um, when using international comparisons, it's important to exclude demographic variations as a factor causing differences. So do not compare African farmers to American college professors or American farmers to African college professors because um, that you were talking about very different groups of people. Next slide. In qualitative research, we're able to calculate in advance the extent of the data needed to estimate the parameters accurately for the purpose of the analysis. <clears throat> so what you can do with, with qual, qual, sorry, that should be quantitative research. Uh, that, that's a, that's a mistake there. In quantitative research, we're able to calculate in advance the extent of the data needed. And by that, we mean that we usually um, prepare it so that we have, um, we, we can look at the size of the population and we can do a calculation as to what size we need, what, how many people we need to, to make it significant. In qualitative work, this is different as we have no method for that estimate and usually talk about data saturation. Data collection is terminated when no new data, new features are revealed. Um, so what we do is if we are, um, you can imagine that if you're doing a piece of qualitative research, say you'll want to work with um, drug injectors 
about a certain question um, and you will um, start talking to them and then you will find after a certain point that there's no new data coming out and that is what we would call saturation. So the, 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 when no, no new data is coming out, then probably we, we've got the nub of the, of the answer. Um, and of course, with, with qualitative data, you're usually using much fewer people. So you may it'd be quite valid to do a piece of research with 15 people um, if you're getting very sort of in-depth um, responses from them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, sufficiency of data and coverage of the analysis. Only uh, in a few special cases can you base the analysis on a handful of observations. You usually need to be certain that you cover the variations of the phenomena you're studying. So it's no use saying, okay, well, I'll use five people and then I'll get all the answers because you, until you find that you stop gathering new data, you can't really stop collecting data. Do not collect too much data at a time and analyze the small batches of data and add as necessary. Dividing the analyses into smaller parts to produce, helps to produce manageable results for a publishable report. And one of the things that, that we often do with, with qualitative work is produce, if we've interviewed people, for example, we will put quotations from them as uh, as they've said it into the into the paper. And these, these will be part of the evidence of, uh, of what the people are saying. <coughs> Next slide, please. Um, proper coverage of the analysis means researchers do not base their interpretations on a few arbitrary cases or instances, but a careful reading of the whole material. So it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's not just a few cases, it's the whole material that is, provides the answer to, to, to what you want. Qualitative reports are often loosely impressionistic because the excessive amount of material is made unfeasible to analyse it carefully enough. And that's one of the things that if you're talking to people about a relatively new subject, it can produce an awful lot of, of um, awful, awful lot of data. Um, next slide, please. Transparency of the analysis means that the readers are able to follow the researchers reasoning and they are given the necessary information for accepting or challenging the data. Three ways of improving transparency and repeatability of the quality of analysis and report are enumerating the data, giving numbers to different sections, dividing the process of interpretation into steps, so it goes uh, a logical stepwise way, uh, and making explicit the rules of decision and interpretation. Why did you do it this way and, and, and how did you do it? Uh, and don't forget the the when we go back to the earlier sessions that we had, we talked about the method section in your paper, and that's done so that people can repeat what you've done. So these these it's important that people can repeat what you're doing if they wanted to. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, enumerate all the units on which your interpretation is based. The analytic unit must be specified as small as possible. Uh, the process of interpretation should be done step by step, so the re process can be visible to the researcher and the reader. Give the reader an exact picture of both technical reasons and the chain of reason that have led to the reported results, so that the, 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 the reader can see um, uh, how the, the interpretation was made, what the units are of data, <coughs> how the process of interpretation was done, and then they have an exact picture of the uh, chain of reasons that led to the reported results. Next slide. Um, so practical advice, consider the format and structure of your article. Um, check with your chosen journal or follow a traditional style. Check with other similar articles. If you haven't done much qualitative work, it's always worth looking at journals and finding out what they have, um, how, how they've, they've, um, uh, they've constructed their, their, their qualitative articles. Begin with the abstract, write an abstract early in the writing process, it will help you structure the paper. And this is something I say about all research if you're writing for a paper. It's a really helpful, if you can do it right at the beginning, you can then know that how, how you're going and where you're going. Choose a title that corresponds to the content, present the research question reshaped into the manuscript title, 
And this is really important because once you've got your work published, you'll want other people to quote it. You want to be it to be known. You want to be out there in the scientific world. And of course, when people search for um, for, for paper for content on on a search engine, it's the title that will that will come up for them. State the research question early. State, uh, state early and clearly. Uh, state it early and be consistent with it. Don't change it. Uh, add to it if further findings are made. So you have a research question and, and you don't change the research question, but as a result of what you find, you may uh, add some, some further findings because of, of the way that it's been done. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, conduct a thorough review of early research. A good review of early research on our topic is vital if you wish to your work to be taken seriously. Um, if you're t if you're choosing a really uh, unusual topic, it can be quite difficult. And certainly, when I did my doctoral research, as I said on needle fixation, one of the problems was that there was only one previously published paper. So you have to be you have to look around and find what is similar. What is what is what can help me describe that. Present enough information in the methods and data section. Inadequate descriptions of methods are often the reasons papers are rejected. The method will be different from quantitative research. Remember, it is the way the reader knows what you've done and can replicate it. And that is the important thing. Can I replicate your research from reading your paper? <clears throat> Next slide, please. Link the results to the research question so the reader can follow the progress of the work. Give raw data quotations, but not too much. Use illustrations. And um, this is one of the problems I find as an editor. Sometimes people, I mean, qualitative papers are often longer than quantitative papers because of the quotes that they use, and that's quite valid. But sometimes you find people using far too many. Uh, you don't need um, three or four. People saying the same thing. It, it, these are just illustrations of what you're, just, what you're finding. <clears throat> In the discussion section, restate your main findings and relate them to earlier research. Don't forget the limitations of your study, and there's always the findings. Next slide. Uh, criteria for good mixed methods articles. Study has two sizable data sets with rigorous data collection and appropriate analysis and inferences are made from both parts of the study. The article integrates both parts of the study in terms of comparing, contrasting, or embedding conclusions uh, for both quantitative and qualitative strands. Uh, the article's mixed methods components can enrich the emerging literature on mixed methods research. It, as I say, this is a research method that, that one time was frowned upon again. And once we accepted qualitative research, people started thinking, oh, we can't mix them both. But in fact, as I say, particularly with with, with, with dissertations, that is the case. And, um, and just to let you know what I did in my topic, I was interested in why people object compulsively. And this, this happens with a small proportion of the injectors, but it creates huge implications for trying to treatment because they, they will um, carry on injecting even if they don't need the drug. So I, I um, did a quanti quantitative research in terms of, of um, looking through a, a big client base and asked them to fill in a questionnaire just to see how many of them had it, had the problem. And then I did a small qualitative research on probably about 12 people, I think. Maybe a bit more, maybe fifteen, and it was fascinating because what we found was that um, people we didn't know why people did this, and what we found was that people did it on the basis of uh, they did it for because they liked the pain, because they liked the whole process of injecting, they did it for sexual reasons, or they did it as part of sexual sharing uh, with a partner. And from that, I was able then to develop a, a questionnaire to help measure it as a problem. And I wouldn't have been able to do that unless I had done the qualitative part. So it, it's, it's a really good, I, I, it's a method I like using um, and, and uh, gives us a lot about the, the pe lots of knowledge about the people that we're working with. Uh, next slide, if there is one. I think we're all done. Yeah, that's it, that's done. Any questions or thoughts?
Yes, question. Uh, good good afternoon. Uh, Hi. My question, okay, okay. My question is basically around the data uh, saturation. I want you to uh, uh, clarify for me as to how much participants uh, do you say uh, the data data saturation has been reached? Because uh, in some journals they will say from eight to twelve, others from twelve to fifteen. So maybe you can clarify for me as to which one is the most ideal one uh, as regards to the participants uh, for data saturation. I uh, think that's, that's a very good question. And I think the it, it's very difficult to provide an exact number because um, if you were doing a piece of research and you find that you, you've interviewed 12 people and you're still getting new data, then you still you have to carry on. So really, it's not a question of defining the number to start with, but it's about um, when you are no longer getting new new uh, information coming from people, and and you're interviewing them quite deeply, quite one to one personally. So the, you're getting a lot of data from them, um, but but usually you do find that it, that within maybe fifteen people you will get data saturation. I think eight would be too probably too few unless it's a very small problem and maybe that you get it with that number but um i think it's about the saturation itself and that's and that, that works on that basis sorry if that's a bit vague but it is about the uh, when no new data is coming out this is then considered to be uh, saturated Yes, yeah, thank you, Prof, for the for the presentation. Um, my question is uh, uh, on the validity and reliability. Some some journals uh, really doubt um, qualitative results because they see like uh, the instruments that have been used like interviews have not been tested elsewhere. How do we address that the, the issue of validity and reliability in, in qualitative research? I, th I mean, I think that's a good question as well. And I think that one of the problems is that um, the, the journals, it's I think it's a problem more with the journals and the researchers because maybe they haven't, if they haven't published much qualitative research, um, they don't know what is reliable. I mean, the, the, the problem of reliability is a, a very different than in quantitative research, because in quantitative research, you're looking to see that, the, you know, you can apply statistics and find out if it's reliable. In qualitative research, you are basically what people are telling you. Now, if everybody that you interview lies, then your data will be probably be invalid, but you won't know that. Um, I, I think that it's it, it, that that if you do if you use your questionnaire, for example, it, it is always worth testing it out first to see whether you get what you want from it. But in terms of the reliability of things like interviews, I think if you find that you are getting data saturation, then that would probably be one be one um, explanation of why that that, that data is you know that the that the reliability is there because you're getting the same responses from people. So I think it's as much a problem with the journals as it is with the research. And I'm sorry if that's a bit of a vague answer, but uh, certainly one of the, 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 I think right at the beginning, one of the things that we said is that attached to this course is a book called Publishing Addiction Science, which is published by my organization, Ice Age, which is that book. And you can get, there is a chapter on qualitative research in it and um, you can get that free from uh, the Ice Age um, website, which is www.iceage.net. And I think we put that up before, but um, uh, is that helpful, Stephen? I'm sorry if it's a bit vague. Yeah, it's very helpful. It helped me to continue 
building up arguments, maybe when uh, editors raise issues around that. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I think uh, I think that, that, as I said, I found it much more difficult in the early stages of my research career to get work published that was uh, uh, qualitative because I think they didn't understand it so well, and they were, you know, where's the statistics? But in, but in fact, it is the data that is often providing that rely providing that reliability. So thank you. Good, two good questions we've had so far. Thank you. We have one in the chat also, Dr. Pates, and this is from Dr. Beth, and she's asking about mixed method, but the similar question about sample size. So um, thanks so much for shedding light on mixed method design. Do we have a sample size for participants in focus groups and interviews, or we only do until saturation point? Well, no, that, that, I mean, that's that's a very interesting question because what you would do in the mixed methods is uh, you will have probably have two different two sample groups because, as I said, when I did my my mixed methods research, I gave out a questionnaire to 100 people. Um, but then from that 100. And then from that, I got some determination of the 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 prevalence of the of the problem. Um, from that, I I could then find people who had the problem, and use a much smaller group. So there's the, I can't remember the exact number I used, but it was probably you know, twelve to fifteen people. So um, you don't have the same. You don't use all of the same size group because they are they are two different groups there. But another good question. Thank you. You're a great group to work with, I have to say. Yeah, Richard, thank you so much for the lesson. Um, my question is on, I mean, there are situations where you're trying to report findings from the interviews or the focus group discussion. And then there are so many things and you risk having so long a paper. So you want to pick out the significant findings. What do you judge significant findings so that you don't have, I don't know how to put it, but do you have to have a pattern happening across different transcripts or different interviews to judge um, a finding to be significant? So do I have to have four, five, six out of 12 people reporting on, on an incident for me to judge that is good enough to say that this is a key theme for me to report here in a qualitative study. I, I th that's a good, another good question. I think, I think that you're right about the length of the paper. And one of the problems is that you don't know when you start what you're going to find, and therefore you don't know <coughs> how long that paper. Pardon me, how long that paper is going to be. Um, however. Um, there, there is a restriction on most journals have a restriction on how long papers will be because of uh, uh, page budgets from their publisher. And so therefore you have to restrict it to some extent. You have to restrict it on the basis of <coughs> um, where, where is that data saturation? And if you have so much data, then write two papers on it. You know, I think I think that's one of the things that um, when you when you're working on a subject of this becomes really interesting especially if it hasn't been researched much before because as i say my research and i did i produced one dissertation and then from that we produced something like four or five different papers so so um a lot of that data is so valuable because often it's never been it's never been you know described before um so you do have to limit the the the, the word length um and part of that can be done so you're not not quoting excessively because there is a danger of that. But as I say, um, it will be longer than the quantitative paper probably. But if you have so much data, then there's nothing wrong with you you um, you doing having two papers. Thank you, Charles, for another very good question. Stephen again. Yeah, just um, shedding some light on you like shed some light on the 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 data presentation section, the results. 
uh, when you've done uh, mixed methods research, there the are arguments of you present quantitative data, then you present qualitative data, then now you, you discuss. But the other arguments of you need to integrate the data, you present the quantitative and then you support it with qualitative. And yes. um, as you look at that, is there also a way you can also present with qualitative data alone and then you, you come supporting with quantitative data? Um, th that's an interesting question. And I think that, that um, the way that I would do it would be, would be to what you said first is present the quantitative data, describe your results, and then describe the qualitative data. And the discussion is about integrating those two. Um, because obviously, if you've used mixed methods, you need to present it as a, 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 a as one, you know, one a, a, a finding in your discussion, and what 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 is the most important thing about this research? And then, of course, your conclusions will say that this is important research. And we've discovered uh, X, Y, Z about that. If there are no more questions, shall we look at the paper that that that, that uh, Dr. Gladys sent us to um, review? Would you like me to share that on my screen? Um, I don't need it because I've got it printed, but I don't know about other people. Do you want to? Do we want to, uh, Carly to share it? Yes, please. Okay. I'll try to follow along as best that I can, Dr. Pate. Right. Right. Okay. Um, I've read this paper two or three times, and uh, it's an interesting paper. Uh, and I have some. Um, one of the points about reviewing a paper in this thing is that we can improve it, and and if we improve it, then it'll improve your your. A, your chance of getting it published. Um, one of the things you will find is that a lot of journals ask for a structured abstract. Now, a structured abstract is where you have just the brief subheadings of um, what the aim of the research is, what the methods were, what the results are, and what the discussion is. It's about two or three hundred words, so the same length as yours, but but structure it in a in a way that people can go to that, and that will be helpful. Now, one of the other things that I um, that struck me in this paper, and this is again, this is a peculiarity of mine. So you may all think that I'm very I'm nuts, really, but that is that I won't allow the use of the word abuse, drug abuse, in my journal, because I think that it is it doesn't mean anything. People use drugs, they use alcohol, they use tobacco, and one of the points that Gladys very directly makes is that there is a big stigma about drug use and drug users, and that's one of the problems about getting treatment, and she quite rightly focuses on that. But one of the things that I would say is that calling it abuse and abusers um, really reinforces that. So I just ask people to use the word use and users. So I would that first sentence for me would be drug use is becoming an increasing problem in Kenya or uh, further on, um, commonly used drugs. Now, so this is a personal preference, but it, I, but I think it's quite important because I have got a, um, I'm very, I think it's very important to to minimize the stigma that, that the, the clients that we work with will be experiencing. So that is one point, but you can, you can ignore that if you want, because uh, that is my my choice, but um, it is, I think, actually quite important. Um, secondly, the structure, you don't need the numbers on each uh, part of the introduction. So you have their introduction one, if you want to scroll down, can't, yeah, there we are. And one one, um, you don't really need that. It's just worth having the little subheadings, but um, you don't need the numbers. There, there are a number of of um, very small mistakes. So I will 
I will look at the paper and send you back to you with with comments on it. But uh, I won't go through all of those. Um, so you've got, for example, in the problem statement, research has shown that many kids struggling with addiction. Well, kids is not the right thing really to say in a scientific journal. You'd say many young people. Um, now, further down there, you've got research has shown that 1.4 million binge drinkers aged 12 to 17 who may be at high risk for substance use disorders. Now, you don't say where those 1.4 million binge drinkers are. Are they worldwide? Is that in Kenya? Is that in Africa? And so you need to be a bit more specific. And also, you have presumably got that from a paper, so you do need to reference it. One of the... Um, one of the things about the paper is quite a lot of things aren't referenced. So if you're making statements like that, make sure that you can actually quote the reference. And that's that's quite important. If we scroll down to the literature review, yeah, that's great. Um, one of the things, I mean, it, it's an interesting literature review. Um, there's, there's, there is one thing that I think you should include, which I think is actually made a huge change to addiction counselling, is motivational interviewing. And um, you haven't mentioned that, and I think it's worth looking at that and, and adding that into uh, your literature review because it's it was invented by or developed by. Bill Miller and Steve Rolnick back in oh, 20, 30 years ago. And uh, I knew Steve Rolnick because he he worked he was on the same clinical counts, clinical psychology course as me. And it's a very good way because one of the things that you that you quite rightly have identified is the difficulty of getting people to engage and to 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 realize the extent of their problems. And motivational interviewing actually does tackle those things. So it's well worth looking into that and, and adding that into the paper. I hope you don't think that's a harsh comment. Um, if we move on to the last paragraph of the, just the paragraph before that, you have there uh, a reference, Christiana McDougall and Matthew Maston. You need to take away the first names. You never have first names in the um in, in the in the text um, the, that will be in the reference section but it will just be initials um okay methodology the methodology is fine i would go to the the, the there's also discussion and that sentence you don't need it the section presents the finding of the study based on the guidance and counseling services etc that, that, that that's redundant because that, that's what the discussion the results from the discussion are but what i would do is make sure that you separate the results from the discussion without the separate sections <coughs> um and, and you you've looked at gender you've looked at the years of study which both of which were interesting because again it's it's you know the male predominance you have a study is interesting and, that, and a lot of them um, a lot of uh research using students doesn't, doesn't necessarily look at that so i'm glad you've chosen that that's that's interesting you've got where people live and that <coughs> again is interesting because um but that, it does make a difference where people live, whether they live at home, whether they live outside university or within the university. And then you've got the frequency of cannabis use. And one of the things that I noted was that I worked out the statistics and I think from your 176 people, that meant that there were four, sorry, 34 that had used cannabis. And that those 34 think there were I can't remember what the number was, but there were, there were there was less than twenty who had used, uh, who were less stoned for less than an hour a day. Um, so it's it, it's not it's clearly not a major problem, um, and that does need to be mentioned. 
but one of the things that will be interesting to know is is what whether there is any interaction effects of the um things like gender or where people live on how much they smoke because one would guess that if they smoke at home or if they, if they live at home they're probably not as likely to smoke um as uh if they live in a if they live in a, a um uh live in the university or live outside the university um <clears throat> when we moved on to the um charts you in my paper they were or the or the, the um the, the version i got sent me was obviously on the computer and the, and the things were colored the the, the 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 charts were covered the problem is that if you are getting this um published in hard copy most journals or all journals won't publish that in color so you need really to try to do it in a different sort of shades of black and white and gray uh, because it is otherwise it's it's it won't be it won't come out very well because i printed mine but i've only got a black and white printer and of course it's come out on mine in black and white and it's not nearly as clear as it is when it's in color um then you have um, <coughs> you've got a list of the, the the suggestions about improving counselling services, and that's that's very interesting given the um, the nature of the thing. And and, it, and this is why, in a sense, although you've you've it's a piece of quantitative research because of the numbers you've used, you are asking them for how can we do this, and and I like that. I think that's really important part of it um what is very clear is is again it goes back to what you said right in the, it goes in at the early part of the paper that there is a stigma and there is i know in in certain countries there's quite a punitive um reaction people chasing taking drugs so punishing those who are using cannabis um and some of these things i think it, it is interesting and it needs to the context of the of the the culture of the country needs to be taken into account um i think that that there is um <clears throat> the discussion could be a bit more full of what you found but it, but it, it but overall it's, it's because it seems to almost run out um so I'd like to see a bit of more full, full of discussion at the end of that, and then the conclusions. The conclusions are important. Um, you know that they're, they're, they're <clears throat> as you said, the the respondents who use drugs majority report to be stoned for less than an hour a day. So uh, it, it's not a major issue in the university, but it is important that it is addressed and there is the services to address it. And I like at the end you've got the recommendations because that is, uh, uh, that's a good piece of work there. So overall, I think it's it's a very interesting paper. Um, I hope you don't think I've been too critical. I will send you the comments on the paper and, and any corrections that I think that need to be made. But um, I would like to hear from other people who've read it and see what they think. So I hand over to you as a group. So yes, um, thank you, Richard. I think it's an interesting paper indeed, um, very relevant to one problem we have among young people here, um, um, knowing where and how to seek help, and particularly in school. People are not sure who they can rely on, who they can open up. So I think it's quite significant, the paper. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, one area I think I mean, in addition to what you said, is the results section. There was a place she mentioned about the effect of cannabis, and she referred to it as being stone. How many hours were you stone? Yeah. Which I, I don't know, but I don't really understand what she meant by stone. Well, it's interesting you say that because I also. 
I also wondered about that because by saying that they were stoned does it mean that they were smoking cannabis or that they were completely out of it because a lot of people smoke cannabis socially and are not particularly stoned when they smoke it and it is again one of the things about drug use that people who criticize often don't understand the the degree of things that people do um so I, I would, I, I think I would agree with you. I would rather that that Gladys used a different word than stoned. How often are you under the influence of cannabis will be better than stoned, I think. Exactly, yes. I, I would agree with you on that too. And then, yeah, but... um, sorry. No, 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 carry on. So, um, so she, she identified at 19.2% admitted to ever taking cannabis. But then when she was now talking about the effect, hours of the effect, we still saw the 100 people who we are in the original um, sample responding. So, so yeah, I, I expected that the people in who would have the effect would equal the number, of, I mean, I don't know, but I think it's, it's a bit unclear that she focused on the people who admitted to using cannabis. Yes, yes, you're quite right, actually. Because that that's actually important, that that, that needs to be corrected. Because table yeah. five says, have you ever taken cannabis? And 80% said they hadn't. But on table seven, you have how many hours a day were you stoned? And that still includes 100 people. Um, whereas it should be 100% um, well, rather. Sorry, no, it's 100%. Um, No, you're, you're, you're right. But I, think, I think what would help actually is to have the numbers in there rather than just the percentages or the numbers and the percentages. Exactly, because, the numbers and the percentages, I guess. Yeah, because at the moment you've got, you've got um, the percentage of that 100% is only about those um, 34 people. As I said, I calculated the 19.2% is 34 people about. Mm. Uh, so, so that hundred percent is about that. So, it'd be worth actually putting the numbers in there, Gladys, as well as the percentages. I think that would clarify it. Yeah, so, uh, and like you said, it would be very interesting to develop the discussion a bit it's more. It's... Sorry, Gladys, continue. Yeah, yes, I just wanted to clarify uh, on table seven. Yeah, surely I used only the percentage. Uh, this was only targeting now the ones who had already honestly said that they were using. So yeah. it is it is actually only those it focused on the people who are already who are using cannabis. So that percentage actually are focused on the thirty four that had actually said that they were using. So it's not the whole population of those who are using and not using it. Okay. Yes, I did realise that, but as I say, I think it would help to actually have the numbers in. Okay. It would, it would make it a bit clearer. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'll include the numbers. Yeah. But it's a good paper generally. I'm not, you know, it's uh, what we're trying to do is help improve it. Sure. Sure, and I, appreci I really appreciate. In fact, I have even noted very many things actually that I had not done. Like now this issue about referencing, the issue of bringing in the first names including first names, which is actually not the PA style. Yeah, it's okay. I appreciate the criticism. But what I would do is I'll, I will correct the paper or I'll put, I'll send you the paper back with my comments on it because there are a few other things like spelling mistakes and things that I'll send that back to you, Gladys, so you can have my comments. And there is a, a, a question from Stephen. Yes, uh, I had a comment on the paper. I think the paper is really good she's really tried to bring out a good structure of the paper but my 
my observation still goes to referencing and APA. The, she needs to check on that in terms of even the table titles. There is a way APA uh, proposes. Then in the um, in the references, you, you need to check the like journals. Journal titles need to be uh, to be italicized. So those nitty gritties uh, can really help to improve your paper. And finally, I saw when you look at the literature, you 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 have good, very good literature, but you'll see some of them are dating back to long time ago. So you might want to actually include more recent literature so that you can contextualize the work. But it's a it's a good paper. Then Prof, you can help me a bit on the the, the part for background literature review, sometimes ma many journals combine background of the study, literature review, and statement of the problem. So what, what is the, st the stand of your journal? But for my journal, uh, what I like people to do is to have a section called introduction, which includes the background and it includes a literature review. And I think, as I said in the in an earlier session we had, what we do is we go from a general discussion of the topic to the very specific thing, which ends up with what is the research question we're asking. So I would put it into one one section as an introduction. I think we maybe have one more question if we have time from uh, David Sidney and Excuse me for mispronouncing. Okay. Uh, thank you, and thank you for this paper. I think it was thought-provoking and stimulating. Maybe one or two comments. Uh, the first comment will go to the abstract uh, pertaining the keywords. So maybe I'll push it as a question as to how many words should be in an abstract, as in keywords, because in this paper, there are about four. But I understand the standard is five or more, so maybe Doc can provide clarity on that. And then I think another comment is pertaining to the literature review. I think uh, mostly they were addressing the lo the local. They were using the local sources vis-a-vis uh, -vis the international scope. Maybe we didn't get from the researchers as what is happening in the global. A village so that they now stream it line, streamline, stream, streamline to the local context, starting from the global perspective. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that. I think in terms of the number of words for a um, <clears throat> keywords, it, I, I don't ask for a specific number on my on my journal, but I, I think that it, it that. Five or six is probably a good number. What you don't want to do is to have too many, because sometimes I see people that have got 12 keywords and that is too many. So uh, um, five or six is probably a, a good number. I know we're running short on time. Do we have time for just one more quick question that came in the chat? Yeah. It's, I have a question on sample size. Do we need to show how it is calculated? looks small well the is the sample size uh yes we we, we do but i think i think uh, if i'm right the gladys used the whole s oh right okay um using well the samples identified using random sampling techniques maybe that needs to be a bit clearer but uh, i think that that's that, uh, you know, there is a usual statistic you can use for working out what the sample size should be on, on a questionnaire. But, um, yeah. Okay. Well, we had a lot of folks join in as we uh, got rolling, Dr. Pate. So we want to put um, eight people joining us and um, we do have the recording so i will send that out as soon as it's ready along with the link again for the textbook um, today's slides 
Um, a couple of our folks who are participating are NIDA grantees. And one of the things I would say, like for Dr. Bett, is that you have that um, US based research partner too. So uh, Dr. Pates is going to provide you feedback, and that person might be a good contact as well. Yes, thank you very much for your participation. It's been a really great to have people talking, arguing, and not arguing, discussing, <laughs> and and uh, and there's very valuable comments that you've all made. Thank you so much, Gladys, for offering us the paper. Um, I think next time we've got a, an abstract from Stephen to discuss, um, and and this is you know it's a really helpful exercise for all of you. So thank you very much for your participation, and, and I look forward to seeing you. Whatever that is, I can't remember now. Three weeks. We are three weeks. usually meet every two, but this time it's going to be three weeks in between. Because I'm away somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.